Hi, I'm Sean Arnett from Threads That Bind. Uh, today's video is going to be about framing your punch needle project after you finish punching it with a wool fabric mounting. Isn't that what they call it? A mounting board? But it's not a board. <laughs> anyway, so this is the this is the uh, punch needle that we're going to frame. Everything's done. The eyes are all stitched in the sheath. And I'm going to take it off with the handy dandy tool, twisted tool. I give the punch needle a very light ironing. I'm not, I don't want you to press on it. This is a really hot steam iron. And I take the edge of the iron and I just kind of bump it. If when you take your punch needle out of your frame and if you see it do something like a curl like that, you have really punched it over punched it, put way too many punches in it, and you have to back off on that. You can kind of give the fabric a little stretch, but at this point, I'm really just ironing the fabric that goes around it and kind of bumping the iron up against the edge to sort of bring those last row Turn it this way, you can see it better. You'll see some puckering on two sides, but not usually on the other side, whichever way your needle, your punch is put on the fabric. And if you think about it, you're taking this fabric and you are just inserting hundreds of threads that was never meant to be in there. So that is the stretch of the fabric showing through and that's probably why I started putting wool around them because it's kind of hard to ever get all of that out of there. Although I will have to say my mom has it mastered. She frames hers without wool and I never see those pucker wrinkles on hers. So after I've got this fabric around it, I steam the back. Now, it's laying on there, it's touching it, but it's not being pushed down. It's just very hovering right over the top of it. And you can kind of do a little bit more on those puckers. If you have a punch needle that you've done different um, heights and the flowers may be coming out or because I do that as well by changing the depth of the needle, then this on the front, don't do this step because you'll just flatten down what you worked so hard to accomplish. And that's it. I am satisfied with this. So the next step is determining how I'm going to frame this. Now we're going to move over to this table. You have to know at this point what size frame you want to frame your punch needle in. And this step is to determine how it is going to sit inside that frame. In other words, this pattern, I'm going to frame it in a 7x9 frame. And, I, and we sell these frames on our website, unfinished, and I paint them. Or I said seven by nine, but this is a seven by 10. This is a seven by 10 frame. And so what I want to do here is look at, this is a, this is a square ruler that shows grid lines going every, or both directions. So I'm looking now 
This direction I'm looking at 10, and this direction I'm looking at 7. So that's going to be the size that this fits in. And what I want to do is I want to get the punch needle part of this centered in the middle of 7 by 10. All right, so from where I'm at, I can see this is where I want to mark my measurement. So this is the 10. And this will kind of become a little bit clearer, actually, when I take this ruler away. This is marking the inside of your frame. So uh, people aren't used to hearing a seven by 10 frame, but you are used to hearing a five by seven or an eight by 10. Basically, it's just gonna be that representation of the frame size that you are framing it in. I use just a little mechanical pencil. It, um, it tends to work really well for me, better than a pen, but I guess you could use a pen. All right, so that's going to show how this punch needle is going to sit inside this frame. That line is going to become crucial as we go along here. And so at this point, I want to cut off the excess fabric. I have found out that an inch and a half works really good for me. So I take this longer, and I have a small little cutting mat here today, so I'm going to do it this way. Um, I lay... Right here is one inch and a half. I lay that along that line I just marked, and I take this down to an inch and a half. I'm not looking at the measurements on the mat at all. The measurement is all being looked at by lining up an inch and a half to the line we just, whoops, Drew. Sometimes on a bigger piece like this, I might put two inches. Um, it's kind of the wrap that goes around it. If I think I need more to kind of hold it in. After I get these cut off, I want to get a 45 degree angle across each corner. So again, this ruler works real well. It has a 45 degree that I line up on that first line that we drew on each corner. And so I go around, take off those corners. I'll turn this around so you can get a good picture of it when I'm done. Maybe if I flip this over, you can see better how that looks. That's showing you where your sticky mounting board is going to go, right here. And then these corners are going to wrap over it and be stitched to hold it. So at this point, what we need to get is a copy of this to make a pattern. And I know that not everyone has a copy machine. You could run out to your staples, or you could perhaps try putting it on a window to get a copy. I do have a copy machine, and I'm going to go make a copy of it. Okay, I've made a copy by laying the punch needle down on the 
glass of the copy machine. So that what you're looking at is this representation of the back side. And when I've done that, I laid a piece of cardboard on top of it so that I could see it. The cardboard is kind of what darkens this copy so that you can see the shape of the outline of this. So th I basically made a pattern of this. And then I've gone to a light box and I've overlaid. This is regular old freezer paper. This shiny side is laid down and it has made, and I have traced the border of the punch needle and I have traced this inner square is not the line we marked earlier. That's for the mounting board. This inner square on the freezer paper is for the outline of the punch needle. In other words, if there was an oval, then you would see an oval drawn in here. It is the area that's going to come through the wool mat. So I'm really, I'm done with this now. It's, it's served its purpose. And this is the pattern that we're going to use to get a wool mat placed around this. Now freezer paper, if you don't know, I need to grab a scissor here. Freezer paper irons onto wool, and this is, this is a piece of belted wool that I'm gonna use by placing the shiny side down. And in this pattern, and don't use steam, but use a hot iron. I want, I want the frame or the punch needle to be cut out of the center of this. This is on a bias. And I only did that just, just to see the fabric um, coming at an angle. Instead of trying to line up the lines, they're going to be on a 45 degree angle, which gets a little bit um, funny when you're trying to do it. But I like to get this excess off. And yes, I'm cutting paper with these sewing scissors. Life is too short. If they get dull, I'll get another pair. <laughs> Not supposed to do that. Okay, so now I see this at an angle. And I kind of want to make sure I can kind of look at the lines. I still want it to be precise. And that looks exactly the angle I want. And so I just give a iron here. You can let it rest a minute as you go around. Oh, I didn't mention this little X. I placed that X on purpose because that shows me the top of the punch needle um, so that I have it put back on in the right direction. Even though it's supposed to be a perfect square or measurement that you come out with, sometimes you can get off a little bit. And then I'm gonna cut around the border or the outer edge. I prefer cutting any wool on the line after I have ironed it on. If I were to have cut this pattern out first and then tried to cut the wool around it, it doesn't grip it as well. This way, it's kind of gripping the wool and it will come out as close as it can. And even though these are being turned over to the back, it's just a habit that I have been, because of all the applique work that I do. When I applique, I do not um, cut the pattern out until it's ironed onto the wool because this is not heat and bond, this is just freezer paper and it comes off like that. It doesn't damage any of the wool. You can still use all of the wool. And so now what I wanna do is cut this 
So this is, this is how that looks. And now I'm going to cut this square out of the center so that it can act as a mat. And I have a little favorite scissor here that's very, very pointy. And I go right in to one of the corners and I give it about an inch or two just to get it started. And that's all I use that scissor for at this point. And then I get my big ones and I keep them right straight on top of the line and I cut right into each corner, right down there. Cause I, I don't, and then I go in like this so that there's no threads that don't get cut. And again, with using the freezer paper, this piece of wool that I'm cutting out of the center is not waste. I don't have any waste. It will end up in a big scrap bin that I pull out of frequently for all the different wool projects that I work on. So that's what I meant by thread. This one's actually connected by a thread. It might leave a little As much as I like primitive stuff, I like precise primitive stuff. <laughs> so now this freezer paper can come off and that wool is perfectly fine to be used on another project. And this, all of that work was to obtain this and it will act as a mat. And this is the top again with the X to fit right over that perfectly. And especially because this wool is kind of fragile now. It's on the bias, and I don't want to move it any more than I have to. I don't want to distort the shape of it. So I literally just start, and you can take these off, this off in sections so you're not just trying to rip it and make it distorted. So I want it to fit like a glove. A lot of times, People are confused by this step, um, process because the wool is so close to the edge that they think somehow it's punched through the edge. And now I just kind of let it come around. And to the edge of that punching and I will pin it in place here. And wool has a certain stretch to it. I'd rather see a little bit of a smaller opening and then you stretch it to fit, than have a bigger opening and try to make it fit. Okay, it's just sitting there, just, just really nice, minding its business. So now, I'm going to use, I like these little applique pins for everything. Instead of pinning like away from it, a lot of times I pin towards it so that it sort of just helps it rest against the punch needle. These little applique pins, I don't know why, they're a little glass bead head, head. They're kind of like a teardrop. And I don't know if, that, if that's why, but they, if you're stitching with them and you're pulling the thread, a needle around them, they never catch on those. Um, 
Anything I can do that doesn't include uh, glue, I do. I just am a sewer. Um, so I want to hold this up here with a stitch. And again, if you pull your DMC embroidery floss from the end that the number's on, it'll just pull out flawless. And I am going to go about that length. And then I'm going to separate this into three strands because the stitch around it, I don't want to use all six. And the way I do that is I hit the top of I'm holding it and I hit the top of it so it sort of fluffs itself out and shows all the strands. And I take three in one hand and three in the other, and I just separate it. So at this point, it kind of looks like the letter Y. And I grab both uh, three strand sections, and I just put my finger in it and let it untwist. And if you have a really long string, you kind of have to reassess the way you're holding it, but that's how I separate thread. And I know people have a lot of difficulty with it, but um, this is a no-fail system. There's the iron. Okay. Now all I want to do is stitch a little decorative running stitch around the border uh, or, or around the punch needle. I like to go about a quarter of an inch, maybe a little less. You can start anywhere. It doesn't, it, I don't have any any preference there. But I do usually stitch it when it's flat. See that, Chuck? Mm -hmm. Okay, I have stitched a running stitch all the way around the border of the punch needle, and you can see that that, that is the weaver's cloth down in there, but it just um, sits very nicely. I never, I never usually see any white, and that's kind of a, a view from it from the back. Maybe you can see it better. And I guess I'll just leave it back here. Uh, so now we're going to concentrate back on this 7 by 10 um, line that we originally drew, which shows where it's going to sit in the frame. That's when I take one of these sticky mounting boards, and I cut these and have these for sale on the website as well. 
and it's a kind of like a poster board that has a peel off one side of it has a paper that peels off and now this part is sticky and this becomes tricky because you're going to get about one chance to do this you know i got to get right over top of it and kind of sort of do a balancing act to see where I want it to land. Because once it sits down there, you run the risk. Now I have moved it. I, now I just set it. I didn't, I didn't press it or anything. You run the risk of pulling that off. You pull out all those stitches, um, which of course you don't want to do. So I think I'm happy with where it is. So I just give it a push. And it is going to hold that weaver's cloth and punching right in the center. And at this time, you can kind of rub across it. If any ends, if you look across the, and you see any end pop up, you can trim it off with your curved scissors at that point, but you could have done that already. So now it's really stuck to the mounting board. And this is why we cut those 45 degree angles. Because at this point, I am going to, I use a button and craft thread and I've got it in a light color here so you can see what I'm doing. This is the um, gonna be all framed in the back of the frame, you won't see it, but what this is gonna do is it's gonna hold it exactly in place. I don't have any glass on the front. And so with that sticky mounting board, it kind of helps it from falling away from the board. So now I have a really long, strong needle that I'm gonna get both the weaver's cloth and the wool. And I'm gonna kind of cinch this up, both the thread and the needle. I want big stitches that bring it together. And I go kind of deep, probably a good quarter of an inch into that because I don't want it to, I want it to have a good grip and I give it the knot and I move on to the opposite diagonal corner. Um, I just decided once that that would kind of probably be appropriate to stretch it equally. See how far apart that looks? But when you get your thread there and you give it that initial pull, it brings it around. So it'll be really nice and tight on the front.
Okay, that is it. That's how the back should look. Now at this point, sometimes I will sign it and date it or write a little something about the design, um, but not always. Uh, my thought is 200 years from now, there will be a few pieces that are signed um, by me that um, I've done and someone might say, oh yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Anyway, that's it. So on its own, it's on that sticky mounting board and it was made um, to fit perfectly into this seven by 10 frame. So you put that in there and then there's a piece of cardboard that comes with the frames and Pull these little tabs down and it is finished, ready to hang on the wall. So here you have it. It is completely finished. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, video on framing and thank you for all your support.